Well, some good news and some bad news. Vertical output transformer seems to be just fine. Um, but unfortunately, I cannot access these cut plates from below. There's too much metal in the way. However, I did pop out this cap, which is a common failure point. It's 0 0.0015 microfarad capper for a thousand volts. It's uh, part of the vertical feedback. Uh, the couples high uh, voltage pulses in the vertical output transformer back into the oscillator circuit so I put in a replacement for that. I was able to do it from the top side and uh, just for the heck of it I'm going to pop in some new tubes in the tuner out of a working set. So 6x8 I believe is the oscillator mixer and the other guy is an RF amp 6BS8. Oh no, it should be a 6BC8. I do believe. Alrighty. Oh, and I, <laughs> I clipped a couple short lengths of about 22 gauge wire, 24 gauge wire, and shoved them down into the two filament uh, socket. Uh, holes and then stuck the tube in so maybe that'll act as a shim and we'll get some continuity going. Okay, here we go. Damn, the damper tube still isn't lighting up. Push on it in just the right spot. I'm going to leave that for a moment. Let's play around the tuner first. first. I've got to imagine the contacts inside this thing are just filthy. I'm not ready to give in quite yet. In the spirit of Shango, I'm going to make this a resurrection project. By that I mean rather than resign myself to removing the board and just shotgunning everything. Let's see how far we can get. So, I can replace a couple of these caps, uh, well, a bunch of these caps from the top side, almost every cap. Even these guys can be done. It's a little bit tricky. It's vertically mounted, so the other lead is down in there. Uh, and it occurred to me, you can replace the couplets from the top. In fact, again, if you look at service info, and it wasn't only Philco that did this. I think Philco gets a bum rap for that. GE, RCA, everybody was switching to circuit boards, and they had similar issues. So, there are two recommended replacement procedures. One is to clip it out and put pigtails on and attach it to the, to the existing leads, but when you can't, where it's a vertically mounted part, they suggest you crush it, you destroy it. Same with this cup light. So no, it's not easy to get at, but I can certainly take a tool, a ceramic, and just crush it to where I can get at the four individual leads and clip them off, and then I can tack a new part in on the remaining stubs from the top. Also, I can do some troubleshooting. No, the two pins are not easily accessible, but you can trace out where they go. For example, I can see this tube pin because uh, so they, they conveniently replicate the circuit board traces with silk screening on top. So these yellow pathways here correspond to the copper down below. So this tube pin I believe goes right over to here so I could check it there. I also happen to have a set of these. These are worth their weight in gold. These are socket extenders. You take the tube out, you stick the tube in here, put this in the socket, and you get all these very readily accessible test points. These are the real deals made by Vector. These are 
not easy to come by and uh, tend to be a little pricey on eBay. Luckily, I've got three seven pins and one nine pin and an octal. This is a nine pin tube, so I can pop this out, stick it in here. And at the very least, we can see is the vertical oscillator even running. Now, you got to be careful because there are some voltages present on some of these points that will destroy or severely damage modern test equipment. I think they even tell you on some of these points, do not measure. Yeah, this one they don't. <laughs> but uh, 700 volts peak to peak, I'd be a little wary of putting a scope on that. Likewise, although it's kind of obliterated, you don't want to put a meter or a scope on the cap of a horizontal output tube. And likewise, some of these points, as I was saying, in the vertical circuit. Um, unless you have uh, equipment specifically designed to handle high voltage pulses like that. But we can certainly go back further. So, here's what I want to check. Here's a vertical oscillator. Should be 100 volt peak to peak, 60 cycle sawtooth wave on pin 6, and it should be 130 volts DC. We can certainly check that. And generally, this is the point you do not want to measure the plate on the vertical output tube. There's that 1 kilovolt cap I replaced, and that provides a feedback pulse into this uh, network here. So this is uh, the oscillator circuit and a vertical integrator. So there's two cup lights over there. One of them with those four vertical components, that's this guy. That is the feedback network. That has to be intact uh, without any issues or this will not oscillate. Vertical integrator is the other one. This could be um, eliminated and it would still function, I'm pretty darn sure. What this does is it synchronizes this oscillator to the incoming sync pulses. But without that being present, I'm pretty sure this will just freely oscillate on its own and uh, deflect the yoke. So I checked this primary, secondary, DC resistance seems to be fine. I have not checked the vertical yoke windings. I can certainly also check that. I think the first thing, the easiest thing to do is put the socket extender in here and get a scope up on here and let's see if is this thing oscillating power up so we should see pin 6 that is what we should see 130 volts DC and 100 volts peak to peak 60 cycle sawtooth Tubes are all warming up. I'm gonna crack a lot of the speaker. Hit the auto scale button. Hmm. <laughs> well, we got something, but that ain't what we're supposed to get. Two volts per division, so that is nowhere near what it's supposed to be. That is six and a half volts peak to peak, and that's not a sawtooth. And the frequency, well, we got free, the right frequency. So something is really damping that oscillator. So again, we suspect this guy, the vertical feedback couplet, which feels a little loose in there. So, hey, so anytime these things wiggle or get bumped or moved around, there's always a possibility it could crack a trace down below. I'm hoping that's not the, uh, what's going on here, but that is a possibility. Here's a close-up look at that octal socket. These are the two filament pins. There's no obvious issue from the top. And I just cannot get it from below because there's a piece of metal covering it. What I'm thinking I'll try doing is just heating these pins up from the top, thinking there may be a cold solder joint down below and it'll reflow it. Ah, now as for the vertical circuit, so uh, there are three external 
capacitors to the circuit, by external I mean they're not inside these cup lights. I just checked this guy, 0.1 micro, 1.5 microfarad, 100 volts, that's fine. Now I'm checking this guy, 0.0068, 400 volts, and not so good. So I check for capacitance. When I cut these out, I uh, left enough lead on the circuit board so I could attach a new component, uh, but also enough that I could test it. Uh, and for leakage, this should be good up to 400 volts. We got significant leakage at only 200 volts. And when I try to check for capacitance, it's indicating that it's uh, short. I get the only time the eye is open is when it's all the way over in the short position. I'll try it on the higher range. Yeah, yeah. So that one is absolutely no good. And finally, we've got a point one that should be good for 400 volts. Significant leakage at only 200. Even at 100. It takes a while, but it's leaky even at 100 volts. Those two caps gotta go. Uh, I'll tack the 0.15 back into the circuit. Just, hey, that's good. Let's just leave it in there. But I'm gonna replace the other two. And I'll try to reflow the damper, and then let's try powering this back up. Here are the two new caps, and here comes the power. Sorry for the handheld camera work, but constantly putting the tripod up and setting it up and going back and forth is kind of a drag, so bear with me. Well, that did not help the damper tube situation, unfortunately. I do have some hope because it turns out if I wedge something in under the socket or pull up on the tube, it'll light up. Try jamming some toothpicks under there and it just can't quite get enough pressure, but if I just pull straight up on the tube, which again makes me think that there are broken contacts underneath the circuit board and by pulling up on it I'm reestablishing them. So I'll just keep this held up for a while and see if we get anything on the CRT. Damn! No change. I wonder why it's still working when I let go. It's because the tube is slowly cooling down and that's going to start fading. So, that didn't do jack. Alright, um, now I want to rig it up to check the boost voltage which is on that cap right there. Uh, but I think we're slowly honing in on, we got to replace uh, for sure that guy. That is the feedback for the vertical oscillator. I was wrong about the boost voltage. It's not over there, it's over here. And it even says plus 400 volts. Uh, I get about 340. So it's in the, the realm of being right. Um, so I don't think that is a smoking gun. The one thing I'm a little puzzled by is if we look at that boost voltage, it's right there, and we trace it down. Uh, height control, VR1A. I don't know where the height control is on this thing. I know on some of the predictors there are dual controls. You pull the knob off and you put a small screwdriver through to get at the back control but this doesn't have that so here is the component layout so we got VR7 brightness 
VR6 vertical hold, VR5 horizontal hold, optional tone control. We don't have that. We've only got three controls on that. Uh, VR8 on off volume contrast. We've got two controls on the back. VR2, the vertical linearity, and VR3 width. I don't know where the height control is. Unless there's a trimmer somewhere on the circuit board. Um, oh, now I remember where they are. <laughs> they are mounted on the circuit board. There's two guys down there. Height and horizontal center. So, let us check and make sure that height control is good. Otherwise, it's time to replace that guy. Right there. The height control seems to be just fine, as does the vertical uh, yoke windings, or at least uh, the DC resistance checks out okay. So, I'm going after this guy. I'll take this socket extender out of the way. I've already started chomping on it a bit. Breaks up pretty easily. Carefully bend this cap down. Get in there better. It's only got three leads on it. If you're wondering what's inside, well, it's a tubular resistor and capacitors have metal lugs on either end. And they're attached to like a mini circuit board that has conformal coating on it. A little hard to see. So cut this in half. So that must have been a capacitor, because it's a hollow tube inside. I'll cut this one in half. And this would have been a resistor. It's got carbon inside. Down to where I can attach a new one. I'll cut these off. There's just enough sticking up. Get some solder on too. All right, let's get the new one out. Thirty six five oh nine dash one. Let's verify that part number. Thirty six five oh nine dash one. This will be tacked in like so.
and I'm going to leave the leads long. So eventually I'll pull this thing out and mount these components when I can access the bottom of the board. Alright, that's it. Carefully bend this guy back. Alright, time for another test. Will this be it? Will this do the trick? No clue. Let's give it a try. I shouldn't say no clue. It's an educating. Will this be it? Will we get some vertical deflection finally? It might actually be a good sign because the screen is blank. Because I got the brightness turned down, and if we have full deflection with the brightness down, it should be dim. No. Damn it. At least the brightness control seems to be working better now. Grr. I was really hoping that would be it. I'm adjusting the vertical linearity control now, and I'm going to try to do the height. It occurred to me I haven't tried actually adjusting these controls while the set's been on before. Here's the height. Nothing. I don't know why, but... I had been assuming this whole time that that replacement cap that I saw in there must be good. It's not. So I just popped that out and replaced it. Let's see if it made a difference. All the resistors in that circuit uh, check out okay. What's next? Well, uh, I am going to dig up the SAMS PhotoFact. So I believe it has a resistance chart, and I can check the resistance from every pin on the socket to the rest of the circuit. And uh, I will also, uh, assuming those are all good, I'll check all the voltages and signals as best I can. Uh, go from there. I'm a little bit hesitant to try another CRT head unit like this one I've got over here because I don't want to risk burning a horizontal line into another one. Um, there is continuity. I, I checked the socket. The resistance going from these pins to the vertical uh, output transformer secondary checks out. Likewise, the resistance from here going into the yoke checks out. What do you think, Shadow? I'm talking to you. You got any ideas? I guess not. Uh, and we'll go from there. Uh, one other thing I want to do though while I do a little bit of research and resistance checking is I want to try something. So I picked up some simple green and I'm going to disconnect this tuner and take out the pile of light here that has a cardboard cover on it. And I'm going to spray this down run it under some hot water and um, see how clean it gets and then throw it in the oven to dry it out. <laughs> and if that is successful, I may do that on the rest of this. Here's a closer look at the tuner. The IF output is via this RCA jack. You power through this four-prong connector. 
RF coming in through the twin lead in the back that's uh, got a pretty ugly splice on it. Here are the knobs. Get those off. And there's that light bulb. It's got a cardboard shroud on it. I don't want to get that ruined. Uh, just this whole thing slides off. I think I will just unsolder it there and take it out. I tried to get this cardboard shroud off. It's really, really on there tight. There is a slit in one side, but uh, no luck. And I want to replace that light bulb. So I think uh, if I take it, disconnect it, I'll be able to uh, work on that better. A anyways, see how filthy this is? <laughs> so let's get a good look at that. I'm going to spray it with simple green and see what I can do. You ready for this? Yes, this is the same tuner. Three applications of Simple Green. The top did require going over with a fine artist brush to dry it out. Uh, something like this, but with a little bit stiffer bristles. And that's it. This uh, whole bottom piece it will come out. I think I just need to take that quarter inch nut out. That'll help dry it out. And I may need to do a little bit of <clears throat> cleaning inside there too. But uh, wow, I am I'm sold. I am thoroughly impressed. That was quite a transformation. Now, of course, the question is will it still work? Uh, uh, can it be fully dried out? And how does one go about doing it, and how long does it take? Um, I was thinking about putting it in the oven on the lowest setting, and seeing how that goes. Of course, I can't find my quarter-inch nut driver when I want it. Take a look inside. I think that's all I gotta do. The rest of this is just pressure fit. Yeah, there we go. Oh, this brought back plates in the way. That's annoying. Not really. I'm gonna take all that off. There's two more quarter inch nuts holding that on. Alright. I suppose the more I take it apart, the better it'll dry out. Yeah, that's what I figured. Between the metal surfaces, it didn't get as clean and it's also trapping moisture. And there's what's inside, and it's all wet. So it's a wafer type tuner, a bunch of rotary duck ducks. Yeah, nothing else. I can get in there and uh, clean up those contacts pretty well, too. I'm thinking maybe an oven's overkill. Maybe I'll just use a heat gun on this. I mean, there aren't that many parts. It's all out in the open. Also, I rinse this out with really, really hot water. Scalding hot water. That's why the metal dried. It's completely dry on the outside. Uh, this whole piece comes off, too. Another couple quarter-inch screws, so I'll take that off. In other words, I'll break this down as much as I can. And if you're wondering how fine tuning works, it's very similar to the way Admiral TVs work. So down in there, there is a piece of plastic. Kind of cut like a cam, where it uh, gets larger and smaller, like a spiral cut piece of plastic. And there's a piece of metal up here. Comes down over it, and it's attached to the... Ch to the uh... Oh no, it's insulated from it. Okay. <clears throat> There's a piece of insulating phenolic between that and 
Oh, no, that's going to be grounded. Sorry, sorry. I'm making this more complicated than it needs to be. That's a capacitor. This is grounded. There's an insulating piece, and then there's going to be a metal button on the other side of it going inside the tuner. Piece of plastic, spiral cut. The more I turn this, the more plastic goes in between the plates, and it increases the capacitance. It's just that simple. And that goes into the tank oscillator circuit, and very, its capacitance varies. It changes the tuning. See all these little screws here? The little screw heads? That's how you set the channels. The larger ones here would be for the lower frequency channels. They have little inductors around them. Big jump in frequency from say channels 2, 3, 4 up to channel 13. Here it is after baking in a convection oven at 175 for about 15 minutes. I think that was a bit of overkill. Uh, I think that's, that's the lowest uh, most temperature most ovens will go to, so it couldn't have gone any lower, but I think a little bit less time would have been all right. Uh, but yeah, it seems to be okay. I uh, noticed a little bit of wax, like on this one capacitor down here, it became a little bit soft. But you can see the one up here didn't uh, come apart or anything. We got the usual sticky wire syndrome, so I'll clean those up. And I want to lube this up while I got it apart. So there is a ball bearing down here and little detents. This is how you get the channel clunk effect. So I'll grease that all up. And uh, I'll shoot a little contact cleaner in. I think the contacts are all across the top here. Just put a little deoxid on a Q-tip and get it in there. A little, little bit of grease on the front there too. There's a little uh, locking thing on there. All right, and uh, I did get the SAMs for this, and there is a resistance chart. I, I pull it up on my laptop, and I'll bring it down here, and we'll go through and check the resistance on all the pins. Took me all of about five minutes to find the problem or problems. When I was checking the resistance between the chassis, a.k.a. ground, and pins 8 and 9, they both measured it infinite. Open. So my first thought was, okay, these sockets have a reputation for being bad, especially the 9-pin ones. But no, I measured the resistance from 8 and 9 to the next nearest component. No problem. Okay, well, what are pins 8 and 9? Cathode, cathode. Okay, well, what do they go to? Got that 0.1 microfarad cap we tested as good, going to ground, and then a 33k resistor over to vertical hold, going to ground. Pin 9, over and over to the vertical linearity control, which goes to ground. Both of these controls measure open. What are the odds that both vertical controls are shot? Well, they are. Or at least they're not working now. Now, considering how gunked up this set is, maybe there's dirty. So the linearity controls a little wire-wound pot here. It actually appears to be riveted to this bracket. Well, that's going to be a pain in the butt to get out. At least I can spray some contact cleaner in there. Um... And here is the vertical hold, 75K guy. I could pry this open if I needed to, but also this has three terminals. And I have not checked it from the wiper to the other terminal yet. Uh, it's possible I could just swap this. Unlikely, though. Or maybe they're just some dead spots, but I tried moving it around and both controls and neither one of them came up with anything. Now, a quick fix I can do is to simply bypass both of them. Pick the middle of the value... So for the 75K, use like a 38K resistor. Just to restore continuity, we should get the oscillator running. We'll get something. We probably won't have any vertical hold, and the linearity will be screwy, but it'll restore it. Now, I'm kicking myself because 
I have got a trashed predicted debutante in storage. I was just at my storage locker a couple days ago. I should have grabbed the chassis because I kind of had <laughs> working on this in mind. And they have limited hours now. And then they close at 6, so it's too late this evening for me to run over there. Uh, I've also, I parted with another chassis out years ago and put all the bits and pieces I thought were worth saving in a box, which I think is also in my storage locker. But it might be here. It's possible. I've got some other predictive sets here that I plan on restoring, but I don't want to scavenge parts out of them right now because they're intact. Now, this guy especially is irritating because it is apparently riveted to this mounting bracket. So I'll have to drill that out. Uh, try to, now, these might be salvageable. I mean, considering how gunked up this set is, maybe they're just dirty. So, I mean, I'll certainly spray contact cleaner. I'll try to salvage both of them. But I'm pretty confident I can bypass both of them and uh, get something going. So I'm going to try that right now. A little bit of deoxid fader F5 on the vertical hold immediately came back to life. Awesome. Still working on the vertical linearity. It's totally open. I sprayed some cleaner in there. Now it's wire wound, so maybe I should try this guy. So it's controversial. I don't even like to talk about cleaning control because everybody's got their favorite products. But what I know from what I've read. D5 has a little bit of acid in it, and it's meant for cleaning metal contacts, like switches. This is safe on plastics and is meant for potentiometers, a.k.a. faders. But given that this is, I'm pretty sure, a wire-wound control, meaning it's metal on metal, let's give this a try. And again, I apologize about the sloppy camera work. Oh, I'm not entirely sure how to get at this. Again, it's... Uh, I mean, there is a hole in the top there, so... Oh, again, it's uh, diff very difficult to unmount that control. And uh, we got nothing. And I was just reading about another guy a few months ago on the Antique Radio Forum who had exactly the same problem with this control. It's a little bit of an oddball control, too, because uh, it has a 180 ohm stop. So the idea being that this pin should never go all the way to ground. So, and it's a kind of an oddball value. Now what you could simply replace this with is something like a 1500 ohm potentiometer with a 180 ohm resistor on one leg going to ground. Um, so, I dug up a uh, 560 ohm resistor, and I am going to jump it with that. And that goes right over to this pin where I got the alligator clip, vertical linearity right there. So I'm going to go from that to ground, power this set back up, and we'll see what happens. Here we go. Got the cleaned up tuner installed. Got my 560 ohm resistor in place. Let's get this damper tube to light up. There it goes. Don't have a speaker installed right now, so no sound, I'm afraid. All the tubes in the tuner are lit up, in case you're curious. Haha, <laughs> how about that? We have a raster. because the damper tube went out again. Come on, come back to life. Of 
pretty darn bright CRT too, and I don't really see that burn line, but man, considering how visible it is when it sets off, I've got to believe it's going to be noticeable when the set is, uh, when you're watching programming. Cool. It looks like the vertical hold control is working too. Oh yeah, it occurred to me that I still haven't put the AFC diode back in. So let me grab one. So this is the only station where I hear static. Which makes me think this might be channel 6, which is the only broadcast channel around here. But with all these leaky caps, maybe there's not enough signal to, to get through. Let me try this. There's a local distance switch. Oh, I made a difference. It's almost an image, too. I'm going to try adjusting the slug on the horizontal oscillator. Not only do we have an image, but the damper tube is working without me pushing on it. Miracles never cease. So it has a very low power signal, a video carrier, but it has a very strong audio carrier, because this is actually a uh, FM radio station. It's uh, me TV radio at 87.7, which kind of coincides with the old Channel 6 and the NTSC uh, system. And they still broadcast, but they seem to have lowered their video carrier even more sometime in the last year or two, so it's really hard to receive. But the audio carrier is really strong, so the fact that we don't really have any sound, even though we have what I would say is pretty good video, all things considered, I think there's an issue in the sound system. Now, I haven't checked any of these tubes. But that's certainly a very simple thing we can do, is check the audio tubes. There's the audio output tube, and somewhere in here is a ratio detector. So let's pull up the schematic here. 
This is the SAMS, which has a horrible layout of the schematic. I split it over two pages, and I find it very hard to follow, but it's in front of me, so I'll look at it. Alright, so there's a 6 ea 8 sound IF tube and a 6CS6 6 audio detector and the audio output. I got a working chassis nearby, so I'm just going to grab all three of those tubes and swap them out. Are you guys ready for some sound action? I know I am. And of course, the damp tube's out again. Tell you one thing I want to do now that everything seems to be working more or less. I want to put the high voltage cage back on. I'm not crazy about having my fingers next to the flyback all this time. Huh. Uh, six CS six is not oh there it goes. It's distorted. I'm gonna try putting it on a distance switch. And cut the contrast down. It's very garbled, but it is there. There's with the higher gain. That's the low gain. Cool. <laughs> uh, awesome. So we're at the point now, I guess get that freaking damper tube to behave. We'd be in pretty good shape. So what next? Well, there actually aren't that many paper caps left. Uh, there's a couple black ones over here, which were those ones that were bad on the other. Uh, so for all the ones I've tested uh, that look like that have been bad. And I think those might be part of the sound circuit. So I wouldn't mind getting those out next. You can see them down in here. Uh, there's also two horizontal ones. I want to get all four of those out. Now there's another vertical one by the horizontal output too. Now the vertical mounted ones, that's going to give me a chance to practice that crush technique. Um, as one of the leads is right next to the circuit board, so you can't get at it. So you clip out the top lead and carefully crunch the capacitor up. Um, yeah, so things are looking very promising. And, hey, how about that uh, giving the tuner a bath? Man, that really worked a treat, didn't it? I kind of want to just start cleaning the rest of it. Uh, like, how about we try cleaning the uh, these disgusting knobs for the fine-tuning and channel?